Good morning, everyone. We're beginning uh, study here right away. Um, and uh, we're going to be looking at Judges chapter 14. Not everybody's here, but I want to begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for how you work in our lives and how you give us a desire to understand truth and how you have helped us in the struggles in understanding truth. We just invite your spirit here again as we open your word. We pray, Lord, that um, the things we see we can share with others and that we can learn how to make them understandable. Be with us now. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so one of the things we were addressing at the end of yesterday's study, which, by the way, um, you won't find that study on my YouTube page because an, another study, another video of uh, Dwight's number 57 was taken down and I have my first strike. So for a week, I can't upload videos. But the video didn't violate any of their uh, guidelines. Um, I'd only just mentioned about the discussion with uh, Frank Johnson, where he was teaching transhumanism and how I said that it was nonsense. For some reason, or Mark, yeah, pardon me, Mark Johnson. Frank Johnson used to be my pastor. Uh, Mark Johnson. Um, so when... Uh, uh, you know, so I made my appeal and obviously they didn't read it carefully because they must have taken, they must have taken what I put in quotes as what Mark Johnson was saying that must have, they must have taken that as my ideas. So I don't know why they can't read, but uh, uh, they obviously can't. So, so, so for a week, I'm not going to be able to upload videos, but we do have the videos at um, uh, the Horizontal Tree. Is that what it's called? Is that the name of our other YouTube page? A Horizontal Tree, or you could say yeah. at Tree1187. One, one at Tree1187? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so you can find the, the videos that, you know, there. Of course, if you found this video, that means you've already found the videos there. But if you're watching this video, but anyway, um, that's what's happened on that side of things. So anyway, we were discussing the half right and half wrong. And um, what I found was a video by Tess called half right, half wrong is still wrong. And this is on a YouTube page called The Midnight Watch. And, and this video was uploaded May, well, I guess it wasn't uploaded then. It was recorded on May 11th, 2019. So it, it's kind of crazy. I mean, if I'd known what Tess was saying uh, back then, I would have, uh, and, and you think if Jeff knew what Tess was saying, uh, that he would have opposed Parminder and Tess much more strongly, even prior to um, September 7th. But in this, in this video, what she's trying to talk about here is this half right and half wrong of Miller and Snow, uh, that Jeff had said that Miller was half right and Snow was half right. Um, now, I don't really like this idea of half right and half wrong because I don't think that's really a proper representation of how we come to understand the truth. I mean, we can be wrong about a detail. Well, that wouldn't make us half wrong. It would just mean that we don't understand something fully. Um, so, you know, sort of half right and half wrong is, is way too much of a... a not understanding some detail doesn't make somebody half right. Just makes him not, uh, doesn't un he doesn't understand things 100%. And I don't think any of us do. So if we were going to take that position, um, 
that not understanding truth fully means that you're all wrong, well, then every one of us is wrong in that sense. But anyway, Tess goes through this presentation, and she's going to start this thing half right and half wrong in about minute 45, what's well, 46, I guess. And, and she's going to talk about how um, uh, John Paul II was right in opposing communism, but wrong in opposing the Jesuits, because the Jesuits were right. So the Jesuits are, are right. Um, so, so they're looking at the Jesuits as these good people within the Catholic Church. Um, so, which of course isn't correct at all. I mean, uh, what was so, the statement that Sister White made about them? Sister White made about the Jesuits? Yeah, uh, I believe it was her. And I also think uh, there was another founder or another pioneer that made a, a fairly accurate statement but it doesn't you know it didn't sit right with everybody <laughs> yeah so in something uh, like an evil evil is one of the most evil yeah um, at this time the order of the jesuits um was created the most cruel unscrupulous and powerful of all the champions of popery right Jesuit inspired its followers with a fanaticism that enabled them to endure like dangers and to oppose the power of truth with all the weapons of deception. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume. Vowed to perpetual poverty and humility, it was their studied aim to secure wealth and power, to be devoted to the overthrow of Protestantism and the reestablishment of the papal supremacy. Um, by this code of lying, theft, perjury, assassination were not only pardonable, but commendable when they served the interests of the church. Under various disguises, the Jesuits worked their way into offices of state, climbing up to be the counselors of kings and shaping the policy of nations. They became servants to act as spies upon their masters. They established colleges for the sons of princes and nobles and schools for the common people and the children of Protestant parents parents were drawn into an observance of popish rites. All the outward pomp and display of the Romish worship was brought to bear to confuse the mind and dazzle and captivate the imagination. And thus, the liberty for which the fathers had toiled and bled was betrayed by the sons. By the, sons. the Jesuits rapidly spread themselves over Europe, and wherever they went, there followed a revival of popery. Um... So, I mean, I don't think you can say the Jesuits are good. But yeah, even then. Okay. So the thing about, Angela just posted some, some books here, right? Uh, so the one thing. I have them in my, yeah, I have them in my files. And I was like my family was so much involved, involved with the Jesuits I saw firsthand and later studied, you know, what one other of the people thing, one, of the thing, one of the things I find, though, because I've read lots of books about the Jesuits, and, and I believe that many of these books were written by the Jesuits themselves. Mm. And, and the, what they want to do is um, bring false information because there's true information about the jesuits but they want to bring false information about things to make conspiracy theories uh to make the truth of the jesuits look like a conspiracy theory and and i've seen this uh, because I've, I've studied into this even before i was an adventist so i started looking into some of these things i had friends who were um you know uh you know, Holocaust deniers and, and things like that. So I read a lot of these books early on. 
And and the one thing that I saw that Adventists did, especially the Adventists, is they would take uh, these conspiracy theories that um, that were being used by others and then rework them within an Adventist context. And so I think the best way to deal with this is instead of trying to find out all of these things about the enemy, we know what Ellen White says, and we know what we need to do as Christians is to avoid um, all of these types of things that uh, have to do with display and 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 so forth, and and then that puts us in a situation where we're not going to be deceived. But to read all of these books, I mean, I understand. Uh, what the Jesuits are doing, but much of these, much of these books are misinformation. It's just like that uh, book uh, that was supposedly written or that letter that was written on August 15th, uh, 1872. Is that the date? 1871. 1871. Is that the date you have? Okay. So that, and that, that's supposed to be uh, this letter from Albert Pike, right? Um, yeah, eighteen seventy one, Albert Pike letter to Mazzini, which is complete fabrication. But people quote this letter as if it's actually valid, and of course, it contains all kinds of, of anachronisms. So it talks about Zionism before Zionism was ever a term or a word. Um, uh, you know, of course, it talks about the First and Second World War and the Third World War. Um, so that's a Freemason, of course, idea. But these okay. types of things, these sort of fabrications and things can really be misleading. And people can get caught up in them, trying to sort through all of this mess of garbage. And so I, I personally just have seen people get caught in these, these uh, uh, traps and, and lose their faith. So I don't think it's it's profitable to try to read everything about what the enemy supposedly is doing. We know what they do, right? And, and when we try to label somebody as a Jesuit, because, you know, I've been labeled as a Jesuit by people uh, because I went to Concordia, where, you know, where I studied music and, and Old Testament. And... Uh, you know, no, it wasn't Concordia University in wherever it is, Montreal or something like that. It was Concordia University of Edmonton. Um, and so it's not a Jesuit university at all. But uh, um, so people will take things like that and then say that somebody's a Jesuit. But for somebody to be a Jesuit, they actually have to be Catholic and they have Jesuit training. Where, you know, I mean, I know that I'm not Catholic. Or have I ever had Jesuit? training but people will look for they become suspicious of almost everything and and even trying to label you know parminder as a jesuit i mean he's not a jesuit i mean there's no evidence at all that he took jesuit training but he definitely thinks like a jesuit and he has openly said that he's been deceptive so but if you try to say that he's a jesuit and try to prove that well you know, that's that's not going to be possible. Um, and even Tavo Tavo did go to a Jesuit high school, uh, but I don't, I don't think, you know, he would be a Jesuit. But definitely he was influenced. We're all influenced by our education um, and the things and our experience. Yeah, so Ron says it's a mindset. So the basic principle that we have to have operate us oper that uh, has to operate in us is to be honest in all things to be straightforward to be plain to not use sensationalism um you know we have to have the mind of christ and work in the way that he worked right that's why i've never been a fan of sort of the flash and on all this type of ways that people try to um make the truth attractive. I think that the simple living of the gospel and doing a small work in the sphere of influence that you have is way more powerful than, than all of these 
you know, huge evangelistic series and things that uh, people uh, believe need to have to happen in order to bring the gospel. And I think all you do is you end up uh, watering down the gospel and bringing people into the church that are not truly converted. And, and I think that's the main problem within Adventism and even within this movement is that people, um, they like a group, they like sensationalism, but when it comes to their daily cross, um, they're not that interested. So anyway, there's my little rant about uh, what I think. That's about. an observation that I've made. Uh, I, I, I go... I have training all the time I, with my customers when, when I have them in groups and we're training um, it's not as effective as a one-on-one. Um, mm -hmm. My, my experience has been when I do groups training sessions uh, I also give out my phone number and my phone goes off the hook for about the first week. And then after a week or so the phone calls slow down and, uh, but when I, the one-to-ones, I usually have no kind of phone calls because we, we go through all the stuff that goes on in their mind. Because a lot of times when you're in a group, you don't express everything you want to express. You understand what I mean? Or you want, you don't ask all the things because you're, you know, you're in a group. You're, you listen to this guy, you hear that guy, you say something. With the one-to-one -one labor, the, the advantage there is that yes, you can respond to the real questions that a person has, right? So each individual is oh, yeah. different. Um, but also it's, you know, I mean, as a guitar teacher, because that's, that's how I can relate it. I mean, I've taught classes and I've taught individuals and the impact you make upon an individual when you're teaching them, even just for a year um, in their life as a person, because you affect them as a person is, is way more powerful than if they were just like a student in a class. Um, so, and then of course, when we look at Ellen White's uh, vision that she had about all these little lights, you know, dealing with the first and second angels messages, um, the individuals um, are these little lights. They get this light and then they share it and it spreads. So the, the individual labor, if we learn how to be patient with people and take our time, um, that person can be extremely powerful in witnessing to others. And so our influence grows in this way. And uh, that's the way the gospel is to be spread by this individual effort. If you read anything that Ellen White says, um, when it comes to... Um, all of, the, all of the efforts, whether it's camp meetings or Sabbath school or door-to-door -door work or whatever it is, it's this individual contact that is the most important. So, you know, when they have like huge evangelistic series and, you know, they get all these baptisms, those baptisms generally don't stick. Unless there has been an individual effort, that is, that these people who've gone to these baptisms have been labored with for years knowing Adventists and um, and growing already as Christians. So this, this would just be the, reaping the harvest. But to get back to uh, this issue with half right and half wrong. So Tess here is, is using, now I don't know. So did Jeff first use half right and half wrong in regard to Miller and Snow? Because that's what she's saying. Um, I'm not sure when was the, what was the dating on your, the presentation that, uh, I am familiar with was, uh, the 1986 or 1886 eight and 1888. I think it was, uh, series number 18 or something like that. I can't remember specifically. I'm not sitting at my computer. Hang on just a minute. Yeah, so this is, so she says, uh, so this is tests. Um, and you're going to have to keep your mic off. You can't, you can't keep it on. Um, I'm sorry. That's it. <clears throat> so 
So, so this is going to go back to, uh, where does she start here? So she's going to go back to this 1989. Uh, so she's talking about this conflict between the Catholic Church and communism. Uh, you have John Paul II, and he, he's the leadership of the Catholic Church now in this history, a butler and Wagner, Wagner, who's right and who's wrong. So she's, now this is, I believe, um, not correct. So in my reading of what Ellen White says, she she never says that Butler is half right and Wagner's half right. Right. She says that they don't both don't, in her mind, understand everything. That that is, what they're presenting is not uh, complete. I, I can't remember the words. If somebody can find the statement, because we read it before. Um, but their understanding is not. Um, I can't remember the word she uses. I don't know if it's right. Um, but there are many things that they don't understand fully, right? Which is which is true of every single one of us. If I'm going to present something, I'm presenting things as I understand them. And there's no way that I understand everything 100% correctly. Yeah, so uh, Samuel says here, half right and half wrong um, was one form of sowing doubt in people's minds and doubting the message. Yes, that's correct. That's what was being done here. And I don't think that's what Ellen White was doing when she was talking about Butler and Wagner. When it came to the law in Galatians, you can't say Wagner was wrong. Because he was correct. What she does say, though, is that the law in Galatians also includes the ceremonial law, which, you know, in a sense, they had presented this discussion in this dialectic, you know, sort of all or nothing, right? But none of that detracts from anything that Wagner was saying about the law in Galatians. Right. So the law in Galatians includes the ceremonial law. That's that's all Ellen White really added to that discussion, as far as I understand it. But do you, she wouldn't have said that Wagner is only half right. So so somehow this was picked up and I don't know if Jeff applied it, but that's what she seems to be saying is that in that discussion. Um. Um, so, so Tess goes on um, here, uh, working question of when he, did he step up and start counterfeiting and preparing the papacy for the end of the world history for the final conflict? I'll discuss that date in a minute. What I want us to see is that between 1962 and this final preparation within the Catholic Church, you have another attempt, uh, the history of 1989. So here she's talking about 1962. That would be what? What's 1962? Well, you have the, the Cuban crisis. Yeah, and, and you also have in that period the Second Vatican Council. I don't remember the act, actual year of that. But she might be referring to the Cuban crisis as well. But she's going to talk about the Second Vatican Council um, in some of this here. Um, now, this history of Butler and Wagner, who's right and who's wrong? According to Ellen White's comments of that history, she says neither of them have, have all the light on the issue. And, of course, that's true. So you can't say that they're half right and half wrong. This is where we start entering the topic of half right and half wrong, she says. In, in this history in 1989, John Paul II is trying to do a good work for their church. And what is that good work? He wants to defeat the king of the south, who wants to defeat the Soviet Union. Um, but within the Catholic Church, what do you have? Civil war, because who is fighting against him, who is his ideologically uh, opposed to 
the Jesuits. This is a history, this 1989 history is a history of civil war within the Catholic Church to a scale I don't think we're really fully aware of, of, of it. Was John Paul II against the Jesuits and they were strongly opposed to each other, so much so that in the history of 1987, a close associate of John Paul II, a man known as Malachi Martin, who wrote a book uh, defending John Paul II titled The Jesuits and the Portrayal of the Roman Catholic Church. And you find there that there's this split and the civil war between them. So John Paul II, he's trying to do the right work in defeating the Soviet Union, but he's fighting against the Jesuits. And I would suggest that he's half right. He's trying to defeat the Soviet Union, but the Jesuits who were right on the Second Vatican Council and the changes that needed to happen within the Catholic Church. So in this half right, half wrong issue, as far as uh, the Jesuits are concerned, we would have to say that Tess is definitely against the spirit of prophecy. I mean, are the Jesuits right in what needs to happen within the Catholic Church? I mean, I mean, the Jesuits wanted to make the Catholic Church probably more appealing, but I don't know. I mean, I think for a Seventh-day Adventist to be talking about the Jesuits being right, um, you know, this is a very subtle attack upon uh, Adventism. So um, talking about Jeff here in that Mil he said that Miller and Snow were half right and half wrong. Um, was half right Snow and half right Miller. They both had truth in their messages, but they were opposed to each other because they were also half wrong. Samuel Snow predicted that October 22 would be the second advent, and it wasn't. So Samuel Snow was half right and half wrong. You come to this history, and Butler and Wagner are half right and half wrong. And what he did with this was he said that you have these other histories, two other histories. It's Miller and Snow. It's Butler and Wagner. He lined up th that up with himself and Elder Parminder. So... So that means Jeff took these stories and lined up himself and Parminder in the history of 2012 and the rejection of time. He said that Miller and Snow were half right and half wrong, and Butler and Snow were half right and half wrong. Therefore, in this dispensation, he was half right and half wrong, and Elder Parminder was half right and half wrong. This is the dis dispensation of 2012 to 2000, sorry, the dispensation of 9-11. I'll wrap up these. We've talked, uh, so anyway, that's going to be the end of her, her message. Um, so in, when we get back to Judges 14, how, how are we applying this? What is this half right, half wrong? How, why were we even talking about it in the first place? Well, I had noticed this half right and half wrong thing a few days before this event. And as I was looking at this thing, we were looking at different people having part of the truth. Okay, the uh, we've got two groups right now that, that are um, advertising something that's not consistent with Miller's rules. Yeah. And then it's it's kind of like you had said earlier, um, a, way, a ways back. It's kind of like a showdown, sort of. It's not really a, sh you know, it's it's we can see it in the lines of what's going on, and we also see in the lines how it kind of like works its way out or something. I mean, I don't know exactly what we're seeing, but it doesn't seem to be a bad thing. It's not. It's not talking it in it as as if it's devastating, but we can also see that, you know, this this aggravation that's going on amongst these groups is detrimental to the whole group. You know, so what what I kind of seen was, you know, whether you whether whoever is half right and half wrong, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's it's the contention that is it's derived from it. Um, 
and so we're what, what I see is just a need. And I will tell you that uh, I was quite surprised um, last Sabbath with what went on. <laughs> I was expecting something completely different, but um, I was I was quite in in um, uh, happy. I was quite happy of okay. what how it went on. Yeah. Well, and and it takes time and patience to work through these things. Uh, that's just what I'm thinking, you know. Um, but we got to perpetuate that uh, what it is that we're we're needing to do, which is, you know, forbear, <laughs> long and for long and um, okay. patience. So the idea then of half right and half wrong. What so we're just because we're not saying that that people are half right and half wrong, are we? That's not the way that I understand it. I don't think so. I mean, um, Jeff, as I as the more I looked and read on this subject, he was he was just using that as um, a point where he was discussing what was going on prior to that date that he was doing this and which was in April. I think I put the date in the, um, 2019 is when he made these yeah. statements. Well, and, and Tess is replying on May 11th. So I don't know exactly when, so it might've been like a month before or something, but I, th I thought that Jeff was saying it in the context that, you know, he was taking the torch and passing it to Parminder. At that time, yeah. yeah. But he was, he, he, he kept using this. No, he was actually, I think it was, he says, I'm arguing is how Parminder and I'm saying here that here, 2012, he was uh, half right and half wrong because he was typifying Wagner becoming, coming to me, Butler, Opposing the old view, time shall be no longer, and Wagner was half right. Yeah, and so, I was half right. Right, so it's going to be about this issue of of time setting. Right. But so he's trying to show how he he believes that he was wrong in opposing Parminder, but it's it's part of Adventist history. Right. But That's I don't, what I've seen. It. I don't agree with that it. interpretation that Jeff has made. Because I don't, I don't see it as Wagner is half wrong. I don't take Ellen White's statements in that way. Um, Butler was wrong in what he was doing. He wasn't half right. And that's not what Ellen White's saying in saying that they both don't have the complete light. What she's trying to argue there is that we need to study these things out, right? That we, we can't just take the words of men well, that was um, the impression I was getting from Ellen that White she, that we needed to study this out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's and all together. Yeah, then that's all she was saying. She she's trying to bring the men together to study. It's not it's not a question, you know, that Wagner's uh, wrong in what he's teaching. Right. You know, we don't understand things fully, and that's what she's trying to say, and and mm -hmm. that's the position that I've always had. Because I know as an individual, I don't know everything. I mean, if I look at my spiritual un growth and my spiritual understanding, you know, in the last 40 years, I mean, I can't look back in the past and just say, well, I was, I was only half right about things. God was leading step by step. So I may not have understood everything fully, and I still don't, because my, my spiritual growth continues. But you wouldn't go back and just say, well, I was wrong. Because when I look at, at what God was teaching me, he was teaching me truth. It, you know, the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. You don't just take your past experience and say, well, because I thought this thing incorrectly, that means my experience was wrong. But in, in the case of Butler and Wagner, Wagner is teaching truths that need to be understood, it doesn't mean that that Butler should just, um, 
you know, listen to Wagner. They needed to study together. And that's what she's she was doing. And this is what this movement needs to do. If we're going to understand the truth, we have to recognize that light comes to different individuals. God doesn't just use a single individual to give us light. And uh, it's important for us to, to study together, to understand what other people are saying, um, and to be corrected when we are in error, because all of us uh, have error in our thinking. You know, and, and, and none of us has, uh, you know, because of the limitations of humanity, has the best way to do everything. That is how I do things. It has to do with who I am as a person. And, you know, other people are going to see other, other ways in which to present the truth, other ways in which to express things, because they're going to reach different people than I reach. You know, this is a body. The, not everybody is a hand. Not everybody is an eye. Not everybody is an ear. Right? We're, we're all different. So, so God uses these differences in us to spread the gospel. And so we can't just say because somebody's, um, you know, baptizing and, and they're, you know, they're not with us, so to speak. You know, Christ says that he's not against us, he's for us. Something to that effect, right? I can't remember how the, the words of Christ do. But, you know, he that doesn't, uh, uh, something about scatter, scattering and gathering, I can't remember how it goes. Um but the idea there is that there are people who are going to be preaching a message that isn't identical with our message, but are still going to be doing God's work. And even within the movement, different people have different emphasis. You can't just dismiss their emphasis as now they're in error because they don't understand something that I particularly understand or don't see it as important as I see it. <clears throat> so I think that's that's where we were were what we were addressing half right and half wrong, because you had brought it up uh, because of this video. But now when we look at um, Judges 14 there in front of us, we were addressing this riddle. So there was a few other things that we needed to talk about. I can't remember what they were. Do I do remember what some of these points were that we wanted to discuss? We've got several points to address. However, to, to really place the situation on this half right and half wrong in its proper perspective, mm -hmm. we would need to deal with letter 21, October 14th, 1888. And we would be looking at paragraphs 15 and 16. This is a letter that Mrs. White wrote to G.I. Butler, who was president of the conference at that time. Mm -hmm. Mrs. White says, you speak, dear brother, to G.I. Butler, mm -hmm. of that terrible conference, the last held in Battle Creek, while I was in Switzerland. Now, which conference was she referring to? The uh, 1886 conference. Yeah. That conference was presented to me in the night season. My guide said, follow me. I have some things to show you. So this is Ellen White's guide, who I would assume to be Gabriel. My guide said, follow me. I have some things to show you. He led me where I was a spectator of the scenes that transpired at that meeting. I was shown the attitude of some of the ministers, yourself in particular, at that meeting, and I can say with you, my brother, it was a terrible conference. My guide then had many things to say which left an indelible impression upon my mind. His words were solemn and earnest. He opened before me the condition of the church at Battle Creek. This is not just individuals. This is the church as a whole. This is the movement as a whole. I can only give here a meager portion of what was said to me. He stated that the church needed the energy of Christ 
that all must cling close to the Bible, for it alone can give a correct knowledge of God's will. A time of trial was before us, and great evils would be the result of the Phariseeism, which has in a large degree taken possession of those who occupy important positions of the work of God. There is nothing different then as now. He said that the work of Christ upon the earth was to undo the heavy burdens and let the oppressed go free to break every yoke and that the work of his people must correspond with the work of Christ. <coughs> he stretched out his arms toward Dr. Wagner and to you, Elder Butler, and said in substance as follows, neither have all the light upon the law, neither position is perfect. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart, Psalms 97, 11. There are hundreds that knew not why they believe the doctrines they do. The situation right now is neither position is perfect. We've referenced this before in the situation that we have been addressing with some of these other studies. Neither position is perfect. This is why the unity is needed. Right. And, and, the, and the main thing that I see here, of course, the next paragraph dealing with searching the scriptures diligently for ourselves, um, there's also an importance of studying together. Right. So both are, are needed. So often, often we don't do our individual study. So in other words, let all search the scriptures diligently for themselves mm -hmm. and not be satisfied to have the leaders do it for them. Else we shall be as a people in a position similar to that of the Jews of Christ's time, having plenty of machinery, forms and customs, but bearing little fruit to God's glory. It is time for the church to realize her solemn privileges and sacred trust and to learn from the great teacher. So the admonition that's given here is very solemn. If we're not willing to study on our own, we will not have the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and now... Yeah, and that, that's extremely important. And then the other thing um, in regard to unity here, I mean, part of what's what's happened, and, and you can see this here in this next paragraph, where the spirit which has prevailed at this meeting is not of Christ, there's not love, there's not sympathy or tender compassion one toward another. Dark suspicions have been suggested by Satan to cause dissension. Roots of bitterness have sprung up, whereby many will be defiled. Christians should harm no jealousies or evil surmisings for this is this spirit is of satan there must be no strife between brethren god had made this the repository of sacred truths you are one in faith one in christ let there be no lording it over god's heritage i mean all of this type of counsel you can see that i mean and the thing that i saw for myself personally was um, because i had this talk with colin you know and he said that i'd made a mistake in not continuing to attend the meetings and and i believe he's right in, in the sense that well absence doesn't make the heart grow fonder absence allows room uh, for the imagination to fill in uh, those spaces where we don't have contact with people and so i saw it was my responsibility to go to these studies and to continue to go to them even though i think that the studies are in and of themselves uh milk Right. So, you know, I mean, here they were studying the daily, which is an important topic, but something we should all understand thoroughly. Right. It, I mean, if we haven't spent time studying and understanding the daily uh, and we didn't know everything that that Elder Fontenot was saying, then um, I don't see how how we can say that we're even Seventh-day Adventists to be honest, because 
these are such basic things. And, but that's often what they're studying, which was one of the reasons I, I wouldn't attend. It was just, well, you know, things I already knew. I was hearing the lots of reading of books that I've read hundreds of times and statements I've read and, and no new light being given upon these statements. So, so in that sense, I mean, I mean, it comes to Second Thessalonians chapter two. I mean, I've been preaching from Second Thessalonians chapter two for forty years. Not that I understand everything, but there was nothing new there, nothing that related to the present message. So I'm not trying to cr criticize it. I'm just saying that it's truth, but we need present truth, and this movement has not been moving forward but i would put the blame partly on me in how that i've distanced myself from others no they have a part to play in that too but i can't do anything about their part to play i can just see that my part is to come to the upper room and and come there with an open heart and mind recognizing the part that i had to play so that's what we need to do if this movement is going to have unity. Even if we find it not really very pleasant. Mm -mm. <laughs> but the fact is, you know, I was able to share, you know, nobody got upset with me about anything I said. And, and just trying to help in the study, you know, bringing up points that I, that I thought might need to be clarified. But I also wanted to engage in the study. I'm not going to go to a study where I'm not going to speak, right? Or, or that if I speak, it's not welcome, right? So, so I'm going to continue going and participating as much as I can. But yeah, I think that's a good decision, Theodore. Yeah. Well, it's it's what God has been showing us, hasn't it been? So it's it's not so much a decision as it's just listening to what God has said. I agree. So, um, so anyway, as far as Jones, uh, or just as far as Wagner and Butler here, I mean, Ellen White is not saying that Butler is half right and half wrong, and Wagner's half right and half wrong. I don't think we could characterize Ellen White's statements in that well, way. I think that was a characterization that, that Jeff came up, because when he used uh, her as a reference, he, he didn't say that she said that. No. No, I know. But I, I don't think Jeff was right in how he was characterizing what had happened with Parminder. Because I don't think Parminder was half right. Because if we look at Parminder's reasoning, his reasoning was faulty. Now, God was using Parminder in spite of himself. Right? Did God use um, Balaam? Yeah, yeah, you're right. It, you know, God used Balaam. So, you know, prophecies about Christ, and and so God used Parminder in that sense. But you, you can't say that Parminder was teaching truth or that Jeff was wrong in opposing Parminder. Because the reasons that Jeff gave in opposing Parminder were still valid reasons. And Parminder was wrong to predict a Sunday law. Now, he didn't invent the idea that, you know, the 126 shekels reached from uh, 1863 to 1989. Right. So he had taken something that we already had. And then he recognized that we could also do 126 shekels from 1888 to 2014. And that this was confirmed by taking 151 shekels using this other measurement and also deriving 2014 by going from 1863. That is, the difference is 25 if you take uh, the different measurement of what a mana is. Right. So, so 
Parminder in his error had some truth mixed in, in with it. Does Satan always mix truth with error? Yes. He has to. Otherwise, it would never be accepted. He has to, to, to mix the truth in. And, and we've talked about this many times for two reasons. One is to make the error more palatable. But the other thing is to bury the truth with the error. That is, there's something that we need to see that's there. So you, so Satan mixes truth and error. We don't say that Satan is half right and half wrong. Right? Correct. That's right. Okay. So, so Parminder was teaching error. And, and behind his teaching was this dispensationalism. Plus, he was being deceitful, which he, he admitted that he was acting as a conservative so that he could have an influence in the movement. But he had a personal agenda, which was a liberal agenda. And, and yet he would lie to our faces about what he thought. Because to him, this agenda was more important than truth. Does that make Parminder half right and half wrong? Doesn't it make him all wrong? Correct. Now, if somebody who is... Um, which, truth, what's that? I, I was going to say, which, if you go further down into that study of Jeff, is the determinant. That was his full, whole premise. Half right, half right, all wrong. Well, except that Jeff was saying that he was half right as well. Yeah. So Jeff would be saying he's all. Right. Uh, well, I was I was getting at the what what you've been talking about for weeks now, which is um, the study together, the uh, brotherly love aspect, and and it wasn't going on there. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So, so let's just go back, focus on, on this. So if we, we understand that the truth mixed with error doesn't make somebody uh, uh, half right, right? It, it's still all deception. Now, somebody who's seeking to know the truth, who doesn't understand everything fully, that is, we've been infected by error our whole lives, and God is bringing us from darkness to light. Just because we have some error in it, our thinking, it's not, it's not what we say that makes us half right or half wrong in that sense. You know, what makes us right or wrong? It has to do with um, whether we're receptive to light or not. Are we responding to light? And I don't think Parminder was responding to light because he was using deception. Right? If you're lying, if you're being dishonest, it doesn't matter what you say, you're wrong. Even if what some of what you're saying is true. And if you're responding to light, if you're being honest, honest with yourself and honest with God and honest with the people around you, and you happen to have some wrong thinking, that doesn't make you wrong. Right? You can't take the fact that you don't understand something fully, that that light hasn't come to your mind completely, and that you're saying some things that you believed from the past that, that you just haven't understood where, where they go off course. Doesn't make you wrong. It makes you a person who is seeking truth. And so we need to seek the truth. And we can't, we can't judge people based upon what they say. You know, people can say lots of things that are true, and they can say things that are wrong. What we have to do is see, do they manifest Christ's character of humility there? Are they open to understanding truth? Are they being honest in their mistakes? Or are they being jealous and deceitful? Are they backbiting? All of these characteristics, these satanic characteristics, 
um, they should have no part in us. So, you know, what is what had been happening that Ellen White says about in that letter um, is that th we have this spirit of criticism, this disunity, and this movement has the same problem. And the solution is individual. Is that not what she says? Yes. Yes. That is, you can't just try to, you know, get some meetings up and sit down and have some committees and sort through and decide what is truth. Right? We tried that. All we ended up with was a declaration. Right? And that declaration opposed the truth. So if we want to understand the truth, if we want to know what's true, it's up to us individually to decide. No committee of men, no group of men, no matter their position, can decide for us what is truth. That's the principle of the gospel. It's the principle of Protestantism. <clears throat> Okay, so we applied this. Now, why, why particularly were we applying this to Judges chapter 14? Why did we, I mean, I know, Ron, you brought it up, but you brought it up in the context of what we were talking about, about this riddle, basically Revelation 17, right? I believe that was part of it. So, so part of it has to do with this. Riddle. Yes. Yes. That's where we were. I'm sorry. It just took me a while to get to the button. Yeah. So we have this riddle and now we know that there's this other riddle, this riddle in revelation 17. And, and there's this discussion about trying to understand this. Now I believe this is my personal belief is that God gave light to Colin regarding Daniel chapter two, Daniel chapter 10 and 11, and also Revelation 17, that he brought attention to, to something that this movement needed to understand and that the movement should have been studying, right? Studying together. And I saw this right away, that this was really important. But that got sidetracked. Right, right on December 25th, 2021. It got sidetracked and it got sidetracked because of people's feelings about personalities. Yeah, that was my take on it. Yeah. People didn't understand who I was and why I was asking these questions and why they were important. And, and I, of course, was just focused on Bond trying to get to the truth wasn't really thinking about how people were going to perceive what was happening or anything. Colin's a friend of mine. He's saying something that I think is important. I want to understand it, and I want the people there to understand it. But instead, it turned out that somehow I was attacking Colin, right? And, and of course, that wasn't the case because I was actually supporting Colin. And supporting what he was saying, except that I saw that there was a point that he had missed. And that's because he hadn't been following our studies on examining the foundation. And if he had followed those studies, he would have seen the point right away as well. Because we had understood how the Millerites had misunderstood uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 to 45, for instance. Right, that they didn't understand this fully, that there were points that they had not discerned, and 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 also even with um, uh, Revelation uh, chapter nine dealing with Islam, again there were points that they didn't fully understand. They didn't understand the role of Islam. So so we knew that we could go back and look at, at Millerite history and we could see our history and we could then discern where 
what it was we didn't fully understand. And, and Colin's study was leaning in that direction to help us to understand something. Now, we also had a Dilio study later. And, and that study was important because it brought to light the connection of the pandemic to, because Jeff had made predicted the pandemic, but it brought it to in its connection to um, November 9th, 2019, and July 18, 2020, and also to December 25th, 2021, its connection to that whole history of our 777. So we have these messages that were giving us light, but we weren't studying them. One is we weren't studying as individuals. Individuals. So people were just listening to what was being said. And, and nobody wanted to hear anything that was, was from, you know, me, for instance, uh, because somehow I was opposed to the truth. And then this message got back to Jeff somehow. And, and you know, he wrote those 391 words in five paragraphs. Um sent them somehow Colin got them, whether he sent them to Colin or someone else and they got to Colin and Colin wouldn't tell me who wrote those words. He still hasn't told me, but I can guarantee you Jeff wrote them because he's the only one who could have written them. And, and yet he's responding to misinformation that's being given to him about what was being said or taught. And so the movement is, is still caught up in listening to man. Correct? Yes. Yeah, and Jeff was right to stay out of the, the picture. Because if Jeff was here, wouldn't people just be listening to Jeff? Yeah. Um, yeah. He, yeah. he could have resolved all these issues, but would he have been on the right side of the issue? Well, he knew that he wouldn't be because he knew from Millerite history that he can't be on the right side of the issue at this point. And that's because of, of all the things that have gone before. There, there, there's too much that has happened that he, he recognizes disqualifies him to be the leader of the movement at this time. Not that he's some great sinner, but it's just this past history. Um, one is people are going to follow him, but also God has chosen uh, to bring light from a, another direction. And so, you know, here we're at this point where God has forced us to have to study for ourselves. And the question is, are we going to? That's that's what we have to decide. Now, this study here, you know, some people might just depend upon this study and not be studying these things for themselves. And I hope that's not the case. I think most people are studying. Um, but that's what we have to do. We have to study for ourselves and we have to act as Christ would act. And we have to believe that God is going to bring this movement together that we're going to come to the upper room. Now, um, just another point that we touched on uh, dealing with, so that that study that happened on, on Sabbath, uh, that study was, um, let me see here. Uh, just gonna make sure I get this right. So, so today, for instance, is the third day of the 10th month. <clears throat> so the study that we did on Sunday, December 25th, was on the first day of the 10th month, right? So we did this first in this series of the lines uh, simply presented. And the significance of the first day of the 10th month is the divorce proceedings that begin in Ezra chapter 10. Right? Right. And, and these aren't about divorcing people from people. Right? So this is going to be about us being divorced from the strange wives. And the strange wives represent uh, 
uh, whatever you want to call it, um, a false system of study. So I'm just trying to find a confess here. Yeah, so it says here, um, the children of the captivity did so, that is this confession, right? And the setting up of these uh, appointed times, all these different things. And the children of the captivity did so, and Ezra the priest with certain chiefs of the fathers after the house of their fathers, and all of them by their names were separated and sat down in the first day of the 10th month to examine the matter. And they made an end with all the men that had taken strange wives by the first day of the first month, right? So this 10th day, uh, first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month, that completes the year. And we've taken that this first day of the first month is April 5th, 2030, at least as a symbol. Now the first day of the 10th month, we, we recognized if we take prophetic months and we take the actual number of days that this occurs, which is 88 days, so if we take the 88 days and we count them from the end of Colin's prediction and we use prophetic months, that's 30 times 88, which is 2,640. Okay, I'll answer Samuel's question in a minute. And, and so we can see that it goes to April 5th, 2030. So April 5th, 2030 is represented by those 88 days, which we take as 88 prophetic months. But if we go from December 25th, 2022, and we take those three months as 90 days, and we use lunar months of 29.530587 days, we also come from that date to April 5th, 2030. So there are two different ways that we can take those days and, and use them as different months, different types of months, to arrive at April 5th, 2030. So I think that's pretty remarkable. And so the question here that Samuel had in, in the chat is, don't also strange wives refer to abandoning our characters that are not Christ-like? Is there a difference? Is not the way that we come to have a character of Christ, is it not through the study of God's word? using Miller's rules, using the line upon line. Yeah, right. scripture says it like that, something like that. So, so we know that we can't separate the law and the prophets. We know that we can't separate prophecy and righteousness by faith, right? That this is the means by which God is going to transform our characters. So, so they really are one and the same thing. The problem that some people have is they believe that we can abandon our characters and become Christ-like. How? How do they believe we can do that? That's, that's wrong thinking. By committee? Well, no. Well, that's not what I'm thinking of. Correct. Without, without prophecy. Okay, yeah. Right? That we can have the doctrine of Christ, forget about the 2300 days, I don't want to do another sermon again on the 2300 days, right? That's quoting uh, um, Prescott, I believe, right? Never wanted to preach about the 2300 days. That again. is quoting Prescott, yes. But he wants to talk about Christ. And of course, how can you talk about Christ if you can't talk about his prophetic work and the timing of that work? That means you're not really talking about Christ at all. You're just talking about something in your imagination. We've come to determine that you can't do that. Right. So, so this examining of the matter, right, is for us to study. This isn't about a separation in the movement, getting rid of the people who are studying wrong. Right? That's not what's being talked about here. This divorce from the stream's wives is getting rid of that system of study that only exalts 
man. Now, you know, often as Adventists, especially as conservative Adventists, we will recognize the dangers of higher education. We will recognize that, you know, people who become ministers become puffed up, you know, with their education. You know, they go to Andrews and seminary and, and, and they lose the spirit of Christ. But they start to trust in their own understanding. But people don't have to go to university to do that. People can do that in all kinds of ways. There's, there is a system of study that just puffs up. Conspiracy theories are part of that. They can make us feel like we understand the truth because we understand the work of the enemy, for instance. But yet we cannot see how Satan has deceived us personally. You know, and, and I'm not saying that, you know, we shouldn't know about the Jesuits because Ellen White plainly tells us about them. And, and that was one of the things that was, to me, um, the most attractive, in a sense, about what Parminder was saying, at least in the way that he said it when I was there in 2018, is he seemed to be presenting the truth. Because the first thing that he did, the first thing he presented in 2018 when he got there, because I was there before him. So when he showed up and he did his first presentation, it was all about how we should be studying how we used to study, that we shouldn't just be listening to the message of uh, the person doing the presentation, that we should be studying together. So what was, what was I was going to say, what was Satan doing? But what was Parminder doing when he presented that? Why did he do that and then not why did he say that that and then not do it? Wasn't he basically distracting people? Right. It was it's type of a sleight of hand. Yes. Yeah. Now part of it was also behind it is that he said, you know, people have been presenting in our meetings who shouldn't be presenting. And so I went up to him and I asked, are you including me in that? Because I wasn't ever officially approved as a presenter. And yeah, it's called the bait and switch, yes. Um, which Parminder uses all the time. So, so I went up and asked him, I said, you know, are you talking about me? Because, you know, I've never been approved as a presenter, and yet I've been presenting. He said, oh, no, I have no worry or concern about you whatsoever. You know, you and Heidi are just, just fine, you know. Of course, he was lying to my face, because behind the scenes, I now know that he was involved in uh, trying to discredit me. But at the time, I didn't know that. So, so he was presenting something. That was true, but he wasn't going to follow it. So this, this type of deceit is characterizes Parminder. He's not as open as the day, which is how we should be. But that's why we can't really trust what people say. We have to see what people do. But also, we have to do what is right. If we're going to depend upon other people to do what is right, um, you know, and that's one of the things that's that's bothered me in this movement to a degree is that people may recognize what is right, but they don't always stand up for what is right, either by their words or their actions. Right, so it's. It's extremely important that we have our voices heard when we see people being mistreated, when we see error being presented, that we can't just hope that somebody else points it out, that we ourselves need to have our voices heard, that we need to study together, we need to speak the truth, we need to recognize when something is done that is not in accordance with Christ's character. But often we don't because... We don't want to be singled out. You 
we don't want to have it clearly seen upon which side of an issue we stand. And, and that is, what does Ellen White call that? I think you know what uh, statement I'm referring to. I just can't remember how she says it. What, what does she call it? Something in an, in a crisis? People know what I'm talking about here? I believe I've heard the statement, but I'm not recalling I, it correctly. I don't know if it's neutrality. Yeah, neutrality at the time of crisis were not to have. Yeah. Yeah, but she doesn't use, I don't know, how do you spell neutrality? Um, N-E-U-T-R-A-L-I-T-Y. Okay. So, I don't know if it's the word neutrality, but it might be. Um, yeah, here's what she says. What astonishing deceptive deception and fearful blindness had, like a dark cloud covered Israel. This blindness and apostasy had not closed about them suddenly, it had come upon them gradually, as they had not heeded the word of reproof and warning, which the Lord had sent um, to them because of their pride and, and, of the, and their sins. And now in this fearful crisis, in the presence of the idolatrous priest and the apostate king, so this is Mount Carmel, they remained neutral. If God abhors one sin above another, of which his people are guilty, it is doing nothing in case of an emergency. Indifference and neutrality in a religious crisis is regarded of God as a grievous crime and equal to the very worst type of hostility against God. Did we have in this movement many people who were neutral in the midst of a religious crisis? Uh, I would have to say yes. That they were waiting you know, not just in the situation with Parminder, but even in that situation. And, and I would say that I would be in that class, right, that I did nothing. I was neutral for a time. And so I committed a grievous crime equal to the very worst type of hostility against God, which thankfully I was able to recognize. But that doesn't excuse it. But that same thing, of course, happened in, in a sense. My own neutrality came back uh, to bite me, right? In these other crises that have arisen in this movement, many people were neutral when they should have been speaking out, right? You know, often we let somebody else take the enemy fire rather than joining them. Right. Um, I, so, yeah. yeah, I would have to say, yeah, I'm just reflecting upon my own experience. Yeah. So. Because there's many people who would support me in words, you know, by email or things like that, but they would not speak up publicly. You know, well, it's it's hard to take live fire. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got to keep your head down. Um, hope like, uh, pray that you're you're behind a berm. Pray that that Kevlar helmet is going to <laughs> deflect that round. But you know, somebody's out there in no man's land. You know, between the trenches. You know, having some people from his trench yelling, "We're with you, brother." doesn't really do much good. You, you understand what I'm saying, right? Well, yeah, if they're just yelling, but if they're, if they're, well, uh, if they're, actually shots, <laughs> if they're taking accurate shots at the enemy, 
yeah. you know, um, from the trenches to support that brother that's in the no man's land. Yeah, but but if they're not doing anything and they're just they're just that's giving, right, it just definitely doesn't help. Yeah, but, we can see how um, that would impact the the soldier uh, knowing that you your commander absolutely abhors neutrality in that situation. Yeah. And so we know that when we look at, at this story of um, in judges, you know, we're trying to understand this story and how, how it relates to our lives. We can see that this is about the message of July 18th and there's all kinds of things involved in this story that we have sorted out. Uh, But we know there's this riddle And, uh, I mean, I think that this riddle is is something that's going to have to be understood by each person. That is, it's it's not just, you know, something that we can sit down here and study and figure out. That this is, in a sense, uh, something that has to be unraveled in our own lives. Because... Don't we have to eat of this honey? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I would say and, so. And when this lion roars against us, um, we have a responsibility to to listen to that message. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Now remember, this, you know, this is a morally ironic story, but still, it is true that Solomon, or not Solomon, Samson's going to conquer this lion, so to speak. That is, he's going to rend it. That is, this is the message, uh, the message that comes from the lion, and and in this um, that he got in a vineyard, right, or orchard, or something. Yeah. So. <clears throat> I know it's hard to sort through the the morally ironic parts of it, but this is a representation of Christ, right? Samson is. He's a type of Christ, but he's a type of this message as well. And and this is a redemptive message. So we don't want to rent the lion, or do we? Or have we? Well, see, this lion, (laughs) so that's the problem here. I mean, this lion... This this is is the book of Revelation, right? Mm. Little book open, right? We have the lion that roared, right, right, and we have this 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 honey, right? This little book that we have to eat that's sweet as that's honey. That's right. So, so this is a message of Christ, both the lion roaring and uh, the honey in the carcass of the lion. This is the message that's been given to us. Mm. And there's this riddle, and it's connected with these seven days. Now, um, you know, we have the men of the city getting this, the answer to this riddle. So even in spite of all these things in this moral story, this the, the negative aspects of it, I mean, this is about the proclamation of the gospel. In the ironic form. Right. This is about Christ. Mm. We know in the next one, we're going to see the death of Christ, the cross. Samson's going to die. And and we understand that this, because of the 30-30-30, that this is about um, the 777 structure. And so this is about our line. That is, we can make an application of it to our line. <clears throat> it now, is definitely yeah, connected. Yeah. And the change of garments, is that not the character of Christ? Yes, sir. And those that expound the riddle, do they not get the character of Christ? Most assuredly. So this riddle must be the gospel, the everlasting gospel that's represented as a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers? It would seem. 
So, so even though we have this, this negative sort of story, we can see in it our line and in its positive aspects, right? We have to turn these around morally. So when it says, but Samson's wife was given to his companion whom he has used, whom he had used as his friend. I mean, we have to take this in a positive sense. Is this not the marriage that's being represented here? In this case, Samson is a message, his companion. I mean, however we want to look at this, I mean, it's in, in the story, it's a negative thing. But this is really about the bride's wife, is it not? The 144,000. <clears throat> so if we're going to I'm take judges, so. so if we're going to take judges 14 so we see it has this aspect of the 144 in judges um uh 14 verse 4 and it has this doubling of course of 14 14 where the riddle is given right so that's the giving of the riddle uh we can see that this is really about the 144,000 That's how we're applying the story of judges, that those are that are going to be part of the 144,000. They, they have to experience, this is a message about the 144,000. It's about their experience, but presented in an ironic sense, because don't the 144,000 recognize that, that there is nothing good in them? I'm thinking so. They can see in themselves no good thing, even though they cannot remember their actual sins because they've been blotted out. They still see in themselves no good, good thing. Their dependence is upon Christ, not upon self. So I don't know how we can finish drawing up the line um, from what we've had. We'll, we'll look at that a little bit at the beginning of, of tomorrow's study. But um, we'll also start on Judges 15 uh, tomorrow as well. So, I mean, there might be some other issues that we need to resolve too before we get into Judges 15. But for now, we're just going to have to close this study with prayer. So, <clears throat> okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the study uh, this morning. And we need your presence with us throughout this day. Help us to study and look into these things, to pray for one another. We pray, Lord, for patience with others and with ourselves. We know, Lord, that um, Satan is seeking about uh, to destroy by criticism. And he brings upon us our sins and tries to bring shame and guilt to separate us from you. But help us, Lord, to cling to you. Thank you for your forgiveness, for the things that we have done. And we ask for your strength and power that we may glorify your name. Be with each person watching these videos. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.